How do unarmed people defeat tanks, mercenaries, ruthless torturers? How do they succeed when Arab rulers have been given the tacit seal of approval by the leaders of democracies in the West? We're just weeks into the biggest upheaval the world has seen since 1989, and we don't know where it ends. But the social forces in these revolts are clear, as are the economic grievances. We are tired. We are tired. Mass unemployment and casual work are the reality for those who live in the slums and suburbs of North Africa. There's 24% youth unemployment and this is a region where two-thirds were born after 1980. Many of those in Tahrir were part of the urban poor community in Egypt <clears throat> in places where, uh, uh, where urban uh, uh, poor slums existed. They played a heroic role in fighting the police who've been engaged in torture over there. I mean, police stations are, are uh, largely regarded as torture centers here in Mubarak's Egypt. And the urban pool played a heroic role. Uh, whenever uh, 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 the police showed up, they were among the foot soldiers of the revolution. 20 years of globalization have changed the demographics of North Africa. There is now a significant working class there are unions, often as in Egypt, state-controlled. In Mahala, four years ago, Egyptian workers launched a mass strike that should have been a warning to the regime. If you look at the Mahala events in 2008, for example, this was not necessarily a working-class revolt. Actually, the strike which has been called over in the Ghazl al-Mahala textile mill uh, failed uh, and did not happen because the police had occupied the textile mill. But who rebelled on that day and took part largely in the uprising? It was the urban poor in Mahalla, uh, who at the end of the day are also related by blood ties to those workers in the factory. Remember the issue of class here in Egypt, and I think I can generalize in the Arab world, Class distinctions are not that concrete. There was resentment among the poor, militancy among the workers. What it needed was a spark, and this came from another part of society. The sparks for these revolutions were networks of young and educated people. In Egypt, they'd mobilized for months on Facebook. Here, in a virtual online university, Egyptian bloggers get a lecture from a member of the Bush administration. We, we really don't think it works very well to be preaching at people and telling them what to think. Others used the social media to contact the anti-globalization left in Europe. In the case of Twitter, for example, some of it's not so much reporting, but rather sort of people having a conversation and, and a dialogue. And what's interesting is when CNN and Al Jazeera and others start picking it up, they, that becomes part of the conversation. And so in a way, uh, coming to protest or getting out to the street and mobilizing is something that completely flattens uh, structures in terms of social hierarchy. You don't have the head of a trade union congress saying, we should all go to the streets. It's someone on Twitter saying, I'm now in Tahrir Square. His friends then see it. People start retweeting it. And so that you can see that what it does is essentially it sort of empowers people by giving them new tools and completely flattens sort of social hierarchies. One thing the activists learned from the anti-globalization movement was the need for sophisticated techniques of resistance. Some studied the works of veteran non-violent expert Gene Sharp, who spoke to me on Skype. When the masses of people lost their fear, and when people are no longer afraid the dictatorship is in big trouble, they main, maintained nonviolent discipline to a very remarkable degree, even when they had over a million people participating in the demonstration. These are important lessons for the future. Now people can see it was done there. Maybe we could do it also. In other words, the lesson of how to get rid of a dictatorship is not, it's like the genie is out of the bottle. People now understand broadly how to do it and have a chance of doing it again. But there are still problems and they have to learn how to do it very skillfully. The workers, the poor, the left, 
the intellectuals have so far proved a counterweight to the forces of tribalism and political Islam. So where does this leave the legion of Arabists and strategy consultants who fail to see it coming? Because we live under the spectre and the shadow of the Islamic Revolution in 1979, everyone seems to see Khomeini around the corner, as if in Egypt there's a Khomeini waiting to, to pounce, and that uh, this is some sort of Islamic awakening. In fact, there's no evidence of this at all. I mean, in, in, if you look at on the ground, and if you look at social discontent, the problems are very basic. They're very simple. People simply want accountability. They're not interested in these ideologies. In the fantasies of the American right, as with the Glenn Beck show for Fox News, the collapse of dictators in North Africa leads to an Islamist revolution that spreads to Europe. There are three powers that you will see really emerge. One, a Muslim caliphate that controls the Mideast and parts of Europe. In the fantasies of the left, it's the secular revolution for social justice that spreads not just to Europe, but the USA. David Cameron will make you smile. Let's do this Tunisian style. From social psychology to military theory to computer hacking, one idea has become a modern truism, that the swarm defeats the hierarchy, that the network of connected individuals can do what the old forms of collective action never did. And these events are effectively a test bed for that idea. If this is just phase one of the revolution, phase two could see, as in Iran in 1979, the forces of Islam, militarism and leftism on a collision course. We are now entering phase two of the Egyptian revolution. No political revolution can ever happen without social liberation. And part of this social liberation is ending all forms of exploitation that we have in our society, in the sphere of economics, in the sphere of gender, in the sphere of, uh, of minority rights, in, in every single sphere that we have. But the protesters were... We may remember this springtime of the Arab world as the beginning of something much more complex. 30 years of rule. 